Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first of our monthly live sessions. Uh, apologies for being a couple of minutes late. We had a few tech difficulties as is always the way uh, when we go live. Um, but thank you for joining us today uh, in a session that really is going to be so, so inspiring. Um, as you know, we have we do these sessions on a monthly basis with thought leaders in the employee experience space. For those of you that I haven't met before, I'm Abby Guthkelch and I am part of the Global Workplace from Facebook team, joining you live from the UK. Now, regular viewers who tune into workplace sessions, a lot of you will know that we talk about the importance of visible leadership. I mean, after all, business is all about people. And we believe a company becomes a community when you really break down silos and empower people to work together. And that has to start with leaders who not only create and enable environments for their people to connect, to be happy and to thrive in, but also who recognize the active and visible roles that they themselves need to play in both internal and external communities. But how often do we sit back and think about how our communications are being received and interpreted by the very people that we're sending them to? How often do we take the time to articulate our own communication preferences or really think about the most effective way to engage with our teams? The chances are probably not very often, or if at all, you've probably heard me ask those questions and thought, actually, it's a really good point. Have I ever actually articulated this? Well, that's why I am so pleased to be joined today by Erica Dewan. Erica is the leading authority on 21st century collaboration in a digital workplace, and her research and insights on connectional intelligence and digital body language help teams and organizations worldwide thrive in today's workplace. Now, before I hand over to, to Erica and introduce her, I just need to say that her new book, Digital Body Language, has been published this week globally. It came out in the UK today. It was in the US yesterday. It's globally, you can now get hold of it. And I cannot recommend it enough for any individual looking to communicate effectively on digital platforms. So I just want to remind you all that we want to get as many questions as possible to Erica from the audience. So please type any questions that you have into the comments below to the side, depending on what device that you're on, as you think of them. And one of the team will get them to me so that I can try and get through as many as we have before we reach the half hour. So without further ado, welcome Erica. Thank you so much for joining me and huge congratulations on the launch of Digital Body Language. How are you doing today? I am doing great and I'm so excited to be with you here, Abby. Oh, fantastic. It's so exciting. And thank you so much for taking time out from what I know is an incredibly busy week. Um, so how is the book launch going? You know, it, it has been greater than I have would have ever imagined. Abby, uh, for the last four years, I have devoted my heart and soul to this book. And I couldn't be more excited to release it internationally this week. I never would have expected when I started writing this book back in 2016, 2017, that the world would have changed in this way that digital body language would not just be critical for office workers managing distributed workforces, but a skill for everyone, anywhere, no matter the industry in our changed world. Oh, unbelievably so. I mean, 2017 to, to now, I mean, it's just, it feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? In terms of all the ups and downs that, that we have faced over the last of 12, 15 months and in, in many parts of the world are, are continuing to do so. So I'm so pleased. And, you know, as I said, I've obviously read your book. I absolutely adore it. Um, but for those who haven't been fortunate enough to, to read it yet, can you explain what you actually mean by digital body language and, and why we need to become aware of the way that we're showing up digitally? Yeah. Research shows that roughly 60 to 80% of our face-to-face -face communication is our nonverbal body language, pacing, pauses, gestures, tone. We all know it's not just what, what, we, what we say, it's how we say it. But when we're connecting on a screen, what I discovered is body language hasn't disappeared, it has transformed. We now infuse digital body language signals and cues, whether it be our punctuation, emojis, our response, special video call backgrounds. 
These are signals and cues that signal trust, empathy, confidence, or erode them in our modern world. I love that. And, and you, you talk about obviously traditional body language and, you know, how to translate those into, into digital ones, you know, particularly for some people that are just struggling to kind of understand the concept of, of digital body language. And I know in your book, you, you have them sat side by side in some places. Can, can you share some examples just for the audience, please? So let's talk about some examples of how we translate traditional body language to digital body language. And remembering that digital body language is not just about how we show up on video calls. It's about how we make others feel in a modern world across all channels, email, text, IM, chat tools, and phone and video calls. So let's start with how we build trust in traditional body language. To build trust, we, we may lean in in a conversation, have direct eye contact face to face, maybe uh, you know stroke our chin and, or have our held, head tilted to showcase that we're listening, nodding and bobbing to, to signal, I am listening attentively. Now in a digital world, we may signal that sense of trust and engagement by responding quickly to a message, maybe adding in an emoji or an exclamation to show our excitement or an, our engagement in a video call adding a comment in the chat tool, instead of just saying, I agree, maybe following up with a deeper context, uh, or simply you know, taking that moment to actually think and then respond with a thoughtful message versus a brief rushed message. Absolutely. And I, and I love one of the examples that you, that you give about sort of, you know, like skim reading text and, yes. you know, sort of like misinterpreting it, you know, I mean, we've all done it in both personal life and, and professional life, but just taking the time to, to actually just take a beat, take a breath to be able to, to, to read the message and then respond, you know, really, uh, it goes a long way about be, building relationships, but also trust, right? I like to say, and I share this in my new book, reading messages carefully is the new listening and writing clearly is the new empathy. We've all gotten those messages that were confusing, ambiguous, maybe caused us anxiety at work and at home. Um, and sometimes we don't always give each other the benefit of the doubt. Sometimes we get emotionally hijacked and respond to a passive aggressive message or seemingly one with more passive aggression. So. This book is about taking our power back, how we you know, can stop getting hijacked by what may be confusing and bring clarity and frankly, sanity back. And I think one of the things that I'm so passionate about and I talk about is sometimes a phone call is worth a thousand emails or texts. Sometimes we need to make sure that showcasing good digital body language is not just reacting or responding to what someone shared, but asking, is this the right medium? Am I sharing the right tone? Do, am I giving them all the important information they need to respond clearly to me instead of just thinking that what I'm saying is actually what is clear online? Now, it's interesting. You, you bring up the point about phone calls and, uh, you know, obviously different generations, different sort of like ways of working, different preferences are going to sort of like either lean in or, or lean out. Like I know full well do not leave me a voicemail, right? There is no way I ever listen to voicemails. In fact, when I left my role at HSBC, I think I had like two and a half thousand like voicemails on my desk phone. Like I, I always say to people, please don't leave me a voicemail. But when you think about those uh, those differences and you know, authentically you need to have your own preferences, right? How do you bring generations together in a workforce and, and build these sort of high performing communities where there are these differences in terms of preference? We all have those fellow colleagues. One may be a serial texter. One will never respond to email and only pick up the phone. Uh, and sometimes it can be very difficult. So the general rule of thumb that I share in my book is in, in, in terms of bridging generations, but also just our differences across all perspectives is to make sure you're focusing not only only on what someone's personal preference is, uh, whether they're a you know a passionate texter or an emailer or a video caller, instead focus on what best serves the task at hand. In my book, I talk about three factors that you should use to decide which channel to use and to set some hybrid collaboration norms with your team. The first factor is the complexity of the information. Knowing when to have a thoughtful video call, when to send a detailed email with screenshots is important versus just having a substantive conversation in an IM or Slack exchange or workplace, you know, or on workplace. Um, second is the urgency of it. 
Is this needed in five minutes or is it needed in five days? And each channel has a different implied urgency as well. You don't want to be texting when, when it really is needed in a few days and knowing when to give these cues are important. And last but not least, the familiarity with the person. Is this a high trust, you know, individual where maybe on workplace you're engaging with them back and forth uh, in, in that digital water, water cooler effect or Understanding those three factors will allow you to know which channel to use. I love it. I love it. And it's so, so simple, right? It's actually just being able to sort of like think about that framework and those rules to really just apply so that you're actually being quite considered and thoughtful um, each each time you're you're showing up. Now we've got we're starting to get some questions coming in from the audience. Just saying to every, all those listeners out there, everyone watching in, please do send in your questions uh, to, to Erica. I'd love to, to pose them. We've got another 15 minutes left with her, so please uh, do send them in. So I'm gonna um, give you one of the ones from the audience audience, uh, which is as an HR professional, what would be the top three digital signals that we need to adhere to, especially when we reach out to employees to empathize or counsel them? This is a beautiful question. Uh, you know, I think the first digital signal that is important for HR leaders is to understand, especially, you know, when HR leaders are often sending a lot of corporate communications is to make sure that you are not, uh, especially in email, not tone deaf, but tone deft, that you are really thoughtful of not having, you know, sort of uh, very cold messages, especially in this time, whether it's social injustices or heated challenges, mental health challenges during the pandemic, bring the element of vulnerability and humility into your messages. Understand that Sometimes just getting to the point can be helpful, but in sensitive situations, showcasing that empathy in your communications is incredibly important. Maybe sending a video message, not just a quick email when something happened or when you want to relay something. Perhaps uh, if it's authentic to your culture, throwing in an emoji or an exclamation if, if it's appropriate to infuse and maybe connect with some digital natives that may not read uh, or engage in the same way if you don't. So that's the first one. I think it's be tone deaf, not tone deaf. The second one I, I think that is important for HR leaders is to really focus on implementing some collaboration channel norms. We talked about this already, um, when to use Slack, email, text. I think that there is so much overload in the employee experience right now, when to use these tools, a lot of duplication. Of, you know, something's an email, but it's also on workplace and knowing actually instead to say, you know, we are not going to email about these five things. It is only in the workplace conversations. You know, you go there to have those conversations and setting some norms. And as HR leaders, actually helping to reinforce that in the culture is very important. Mm -hmm. Enlist channel advocates for different channels. And then the third thing for HR leaders that I think is important is to talk about digital body language. You know, your, your ability as a role model for your employees around the importance of the skill, not only you know asking your teammates what signals you may be sending, but also to encourage them to think about the importance of their digital body language as well. And and maybe a quick plug is the book is a great book club for uh, you know your HR teams, but also for your employees to activate these conversations. I love it. I love it, and I love the tone deft element. It's so so key. Um, and, uh, you know, just taking that time and, uh, you know, as you know, we've, we've spoken a lot about emojis in the past. I am a huge champion and advocate of the, of the use of emojis to, to really convey, um, you know, that connection, that empathy, that tone. Again, not all um, uh, emojis are business appropriate, but, uh, you know, absolutely, I think it's a really key one. Um, something that, uh, you know, at the moment we are majority of us still working so far apart and you know for the last as i said like 10 15 months some of us you know have really been very apart from from each other in terms of when you've been writing the book going out and 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 meeting with people you know from your research you know, what are employees looking for in the workplace in terms of you know 2021 or even sort of like you know the, the future of work you know how can how can we really help leaders connect with employees in a meaningful way I think at the top of the list is they're looking for flexibility, but they're also looking to not be biased or judged by a flexible culture. So what that means is 
you know, if, if a leader says, we are truly a work from anywhere culture, you can re work remote or you only have to come in two days a week. Uh, there's one thing to say it. There's another thing when it comes to performance reviews to see if leaders are really judging those that are in the office and those that were remote in the last year. And that's a big experiment that we have yet to see. We should really, you know, analyze and look at the data around over the next year. And so, uh, many lawyers that are not just talking the talk, but walking the talk. I like to say we write the talk <laughs> in digital body language, but, um, but making sure that you are setting up systems so that individuals are not biased for the flexibility if they want to work from home two days a week, even if you say it's okay. Uh, if there's one you know, leader that is more of a face-to-face -face person and may be more likely to, uh, you know, to reward those that were like him or her versus um, what the culture is entailing. So setting that performance structure that is truly flexible and equal as a result. The second one is, uh, you know, I think uh, cultures that are really focused on not only productivity, but well-being as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are seeing high levels of video call fatigue, email overwhelm, and this is a moment where I think we all have to take our power back to stop sending reply all chains to, you know, setting some norms. If you, you know, have a message after 5 p.m., it won't be responded to or after 6 until the next day unless you call them. You know, don't expect IMs to have back and forth, especially those in different time zones. Um, and creating that sense of sort of on time and off time and really honoring it is key. Obviously, there's fire drills, but, um, you know, truly managing productivity with well-being, I think, is is an interesting contradictory thought, um, but incredibly important. So I think those are the two that I think as HR leaders, um, you can both really reflect on, but make sure you're building systems around in the workplace. I love it. I love it. And actually, it's really linked to another question that we've, we've had come, come through, which is, um, it's a bit of a statement and a question. Uh, Erica, isn't it sometimes dangerous to focus lots on techniques and methods without reflecting on the right attitude? And I think that touches into what you're saying about mindset, but I'd love your thoughts on that. Absolutely. So my first book, before I wrote Digital Body Language, is called Get Big Things Done, The Power of Connectional Intelligence. And it, I published it a few years ago. And what I always have believed is that, you know, in order for transformations to be successful, you first need the right mindsets and behaviors, and then you need the techniques and tactics. So my first book, you know, really moved us from what I believe was important, emotional intelligence in the 90s, to the mindset that I call connectional intelligence, which is how we really connect across silos, unlock the value of networks uh, far beyond our own traditional day-to-day -day teams. And... I think that in many ways, I wrote Digital Body Language as the follow-up, as the techniques, a book for uh, the mindset of connectional intelligence. So, uh, you know, if you're thinking about mindsets and behaviors, definitely check out that book. It's available as well. And, and it is all about starting with the mindsets um, and, you know, the mindset of valuing others the mindset of communicating carefully, the mindset of collaborating confidently. And those are some of the laws I talk about in digital body language. And once we achieve those mindsets, we can get to the tactics. And you just touched on them there, the, the four laws of, of, of yeah. digital body language. And you, you were sort of just saying there about, uh, you know, um, uh, trusting totally, communicating uh, carefully. Can you just take us through what those sort of four, four laws are? Yes, in, in my book, I really set out to share a framework that would allow HR leaders, team leaders, anywhere to institute not only, uh, you know, effective etiquette practices, but a culture of true collaboration no matter the distance. And so the first law is value visibly. The second law is communicate carefully. The third law is collaborate confidently. And the fourth law is trust totally. Let me break them down one by one. Valuing visibly is no longer just about looking into each other in the eye, uh, you know, meeting for a team dinner. It's about valuing people's time, schedules, and inboxes, watching the clock, acknowledging introverts and extroverts and different styles and different channels. And not just sending that quick THX period email, but truly saying thank you and giving credit where it's due. Communicating carefully is a lot about what we already discussed. It's thinking before you type, slowing down, practicing thoughtfulness over hastiness, 
collaborating confidently is all about really prioritizing and focusing on enabling and fostering inclusion, not rushing messages and creating groupthink, uh, making sure you're informing the right people, breaking silos in your workplace no matter the distance, and also making sure you're using the right channels. Actually, having norms around collaboration are incredibly important, but not just having them, adhering to them and sustaining them through has been about assuming good intent, uh, you know, having those virtual water cooler moments. And again, workplace is a great place to do it. Um, and last but not least, showing vulnerabilities. And and that's what that's what I think is all, all about mindsets and behaviors. And if we start by, you know, upscaling our people with the four laws, uh, I have an assessment that attendees can take so that they can measure themselves on the four laws. They can measure their teams. They can do 360s around this. And Starting there, setting a baseline, and then working to improvements, I think is not only a nice to have, it's a you know a must have and an opportunity as we move to hybrid work. Fantastic. I love that. And we'll make sure to put the links um, to those uh, to those resources um, into the into the chat after the um, after the live. Now, we've got a couple of questions. I know we're close to running out of time, but I'm just going to quickly le leap in yes. with them. Are you noticing any difference between the way male leaders and female leaders communicate digitally? Absolutely. This is chapter eight of my book, Gender and Digital Body Language. A uh, quick headline on this, uh, you know, research shows women feel more pressure to soften their language with exclamations or emojis similar to in traditional body language, up talking or voice pitch was apparent. I'm a big fan of breaking those biases. Uh, and I think that you, you can find a lot about those gender dynamics in the book. Fantastic. And then the last one, uh, what tips would you offer to replicate or replace face to face visual cues on video calls? So when it comes to visual cues on video calls, first off, um, it is hard. Uh, it's not natural for us to see our own face on the screen while we're trying to look at other people. It does create more insecurity for some. Um, and a study showed this is why women feel higher Zoom fatigue than men, often in terms of looking a certain way. I, I have a couple of rules of thumb here. Reduce the thumbnail of yourself. Don't look at it yourself. Look at other people. Second. Have specific time in your meeting where you're not screen sharing because we can't even see others when we're screen sharing and you all get into gallery mode and all connect with one another. And last but not least, make sure that you are truly infusing the chat tool, virtual whiteboards. Some people actually thrive much more not looking at videos of other people uh, and instead are using the chat. And I, and I think that you know, there's a lot of talk with Room Raider of having the perfect virtual background. But I think that digital body language is not about looking good on a screen. It's about how you engage others. And so remember to engage them and they will feel heard, respected and valued. Fantastic. Erica, I cannot thank you enough. And I've just been told by our community management team that everyone is thanking you for such sharing such brilliant insights. Everyone, if you haven't already got your book, go and get it. It is out now um, from your favorite stockist. Um, and, you know, it will take if we all took a little time to think about the digital cues and signals that we make our digital worlds would, in my opinion, be a little happier or a lot happier. Erica, thank you so much for joining joining us. Thank you um, so much. No, it's fantastic. And good luck with the rest of the book launch. And for everyone listening in, um, remember, we will be back next month with another fantastic guest from the world of work and employee experience. And we're going to be joined by the absolutely fantastic John Amici, who is a renowned organization, organizational uh, psychologist and author. And he's going to be joining us on the 10th of June to talk about how vulnerability builds trust. So stay tuned. Thanks again for watching. Make sure you pick up your digital body language book and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone and thank you so much, Erica.